Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full showtimes, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Herman Williams. He's an author. Herman, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. It's my pleasure. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what we're going to talk about today is actually really interesting and super important. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. I grew up uh, actually in Southern California in an area that was called Windsor Hills, California. Okay, very cool. So you went to university. Walk me through your university career and, and what did you take and why? So I, you know, I grew up in Southern California, right. really motivated by my parents who were both psychiatric social workers and really had an appreciation for human behavior and for um, helping other people. And I developed uh, this interest in helping others, and that manifested in a dream to become a physician. Um, I kid myself, and in the book, uh, I talk about I had this dream to come back to Los Angeles to be the team doctor for the LA Lakers. Oh, very cool. Um, but and as superficial as that sounds, I it it actually involved quite a bit of work. And so, I mean, I just wanted to be the best doctor and the best orthopedic surgeon in the world and come back home and just make a difference. Very cool. Okay. So walk us through your career up until what you're doing now, maybe some career highlights along the way. Um, and, and well, so. I went to uh, undergrad and then got into med school and then got into my orthopedic surgery uh, residency. Uh, And then out of nowhere, I was stricken with um, a heart problem. We determined it was a genetic problem and uh, essentially died uh, on the basketball court um, back in 1991. And, basically had to redesign my life's goals and dreams and rethink what it meant uh, to be alive. And uh, fortunately, I was able to um, use some of the training I had previously when I was in medical school. I also uh, got a master's in public health. So I actually did a lateral move into healthcare consulting, uh, then spent literally 18 years as a a hospital chief medical officer. Uh, And today I am now in healthcare consulting, trying to use all that experience um, that I gained from being a chief medical officer to help other hospitals uh, through their problem areas uh, and help uh, physicians. And that's where I am today. Very cool. So you wrote a book What's it called, and and what made you decide to actually write a book? So the book is called Clear, uh, and it's called Clear because when you have a cardiac arrest, you have to be resuscitated, and that's what the guy said when they came to the gym when I was laying there lifeless. They said, Clear, Uh, and they shocked me back. Wow. And then the, the subheader of the book is Living the Life You Didn't Dream Of, Uh, Because I had had these incredible dreams of being a successful physician, uh, surgeon, and I ended up living a totally different life with a totally different dream that I basically had to uh, recreate after everything I had worked so hard for, for about 13 years, uh, just kind of went up in smoke when I died on that basketball court. Uh, and I, I just thought, 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. Sorry. No, keep going. No, I was just saying, I, I just thought it was important um, to tell the story because it's a, it's a, it's a story of motivation. And I find that a lot of people are dealing with things. And I thought, God, if I could make the difference in one person's life, it was, it'd be worth writing the story. And sure. so that's what motivated sure. me to write the book. So do you want to give us a bit of overview of, about that story and, and that's in the book? And I re, and then I really want to get into uh, the kindness scale after that. So do you want to kind of transition into that after that? Yeah, yeah. So really, the book is about, you know, it's sort of like I was not anyone special. I consider myself a typical kid in some ways. Um atypical in others by being blessed with the fact that I had two parents who were together for 60 years and I had a loving family and a very supportive upbringing, but, uh, you know, pretty much, um, um, typical, uh, public school education, uh, ended up being fortunate to get into a great college and a great medical school and a great, surgical program and then boom just out of nowhere just everything gone in a flash of light um wasn't able to practice surgery anymore um had pretty severe memory loss after my cardiac arrest wow um just literally found myself in a place where it seemed like everything was helpless um I was enrolled in uh, clinical trials for a new device, which today we all know is the uh, cardioverter defibrillator that can be implanted surgically into one's body. And every time your heart has a bad arrhythmia, it will shock you. Well, that device today (laughs) is probably responsible for changing the course of many people's lives because prior to the 90s, most people who had my disease lived probably about five years and had another cardiac arrest, in which they didn't survive. Wow. So this device really designed to shock you back um, certainly uh, changed my life. However, because it was in its early development um, and we weren't sure how much medication I needed to be on, I literally was shocked, Kevin, over 40 times wow. in the first six months of having the device. So I was tortured by the very thing that uh, was actually saving my life. Wow. Um, yeah, but eventually, I, you know, and people say, how did you get past that point? Yeah, but, that was going to be my next question to you, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> like coming out of that's like incredible, really. I know. I just. I just truly believed that my life was not going to end up that way. And I put in the book is that perseverance uh, always trumps despair. And eventually we were able to find the right medication uh, formula, which finally uh, was able to keep me, in a normal rhythm and the shock stopped uh, right around 1992. Wow. Um, And basically uh, I was able to live a normal life until 2004. And in 2004 um, I developed a new arrhythmia, but as it happened, new technology had been developed it's called ablation. Okay. And so I ended up having an ablation where literally they go in your heart in a butt blood vessel and actually cauterize the part of the heart where the arrhythmia exists. Uh, and they were able to um, eradicate that arrhythmia. Wow. And since, since 2006, I've been uh, shock free. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. So I don't want to get negative, but, Obviously, there's there had to have been days or, or weeks where <laughs> or, month. you, or months <laughs> where you you were probably like, how did you get through that negativity to pull, come through 
rebuild, refine a new passion, and, and basically, you know, become happy again and live a full life. Yeah. Well, I think there are a couple of things that helped me get to that point. One is faith. And okay. for me, for me, it's God. For other people, for my best friend, as an example, he believes in the universe. The universe has a, a, a spirit and an energy. And when you give out positive energy, you get it back. When you give out negative energy, you get it back. Right. And I just think I just had a lot of positive energy and positive belief that there was a bigger and better thing for me. Uh, the second most important thing was my wife, who uh, was my fiance at the time of the cardiac arrest. But ultimately, three months later, we got married. And literally, my wife was my, my guardian angel and my spiritual guide. Uh, and together, we took that path of being in and out of the emergency room every month and wow. and just loving each other and saying, it's going to be better, it's going to get better, and just hang in. And, you know, having somebody there all the time just made a difference. And, of course, a loving family and friends um, and that belief that something would be that it would eventually get better allowed me to very gradually over probably about um, an eight month process allowed me to begin to literally Kevin literally have confidence to leave the house wow. because I was afraid I'd get shocked in public. Uh, and I just, there was a time when I just didn't want to leave the house and I slowly went out and, then I decided to go back to business school, okay. which really gave me two years to kind of recoup physically, but also retrain. And at the completion of that, which was 1994, I really felt like I was sort of totally healed and could go back into the workforce uh, and be a productive member of society. <laughs> And literally, those are the kinds of things that people who have life-threatening illnesses, that that's what they think about. Am I ever going to get back to work? Am I ever going right. to be able to take care of my family? Am I ever going to, you know, am I going to live long enough to see my wife, you know, deliver our son? And those are the kinds of things that we were preoccupied with. Wow. Um, but um, time heals all wounds. and you know, I've been blessed. I, you know, obviously it's not the case for every person, but I feel like I've been blessed with the ability to overcome um, significant uh, obstacles, um, which sort of leads us into the whole kindness scale. That came out of, uh, as I said, I was shock free since 2006, but in 2013, um, due to a switching of medications and us later finding out that uh, aspirin was not strong, was not a strong enough blood thinner for me, uh, I eventually developed a clot in my heart and, and wow. had a stroke. Wow. Uh, and for three days, I lost my voice and I couldn't speak and I wow. just just sat and thought and prayed <laughs> and thought and prayed. Um, and eventually my voice came back and it was then that I realized that I was going to take all these blessings and commit the rest of my life to helping other people and to being kind uh, and developing a scale that people could literally put in, you know, into action. Uh, and the scale is a four level scale that basically the most basic level of the kindness scale is a smile. Okay. Uh, and the smiles are so powerful. You can test this out anytime you want <laughs> is just walk down the street and just smile at someone. And nine times out of 10, that person will smile back at you. They don't know why they don't know what it's just, it's just contagious. 
Sure. Uh, and so that's the most basic thing. Um, then it escalates into action, opening a door for someone, helping someone, cleaning up behind somebody. You know, I do all kinds of crazy things. I buy coffee for the person in the car behind me. Uh, you know, just all kinds of crazy things that I think with the understanding that everybody is dealing with some crap sure. in their minds, you know, some distress and illness, uh, challenge, stress, and bringing that little bit of happiness to somebody can make a huge difference um, in their lives. Um, and the most maximal level of kindness is what I call a level four. An example of that would be, as an example, CPR, which is I've had someone give me CPR twice, right? Uh, once by people I knew and once by a man who I didn't know at all, who was just there wow. and jumped into action. Um, and then there are other acts of kindness like donating an organ, giving a kidney or something uh, to someone. Um, so... Um, and two examples of that, one dear friend of mine, uh, her daughter had been sick for months and months and months and ended up needing a transplant. They couldn't find anyone. And she said, well, why don't you test me? Turns out she's compatible with her daughter. And that's not always the case wow. for family members, but she ended up donating her kidney to her daughter. Wow. How beautiful is that? <laughs> yeah. You know? Interesting. So... Uh, so you also talk about the domino effect of, of the kindness scale. And I think you quickly touched on it, but can you dive a little bit deeper into that? Yeah, it's just, you know, you do one thing for someone and it comes back around. Uh, I just believe you, you put all of that positive energy out there. You help others, help others. And then it just comes back to you. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't come back in equal amounts. It, I believe it comes back, you know, twice as good, three times as good. And that's my motivation for continuing to give. And I believe that that's why I've had so many blessings in my life. Exactly. Um, um, so obviously you basically found two passions in your life. The second one you were kind of forced to, to find again. So how did you go about discovering what you like what your next passion was going to be because that I think most people don't find it once never mind uh multiple right. times right Right and I you know I was I was very practical about it I just really understood that what I really wanted to do was help other people so I knew I was good at communicating. I knew that I had a strong background in healthcare. I knew that, you know, I was a physician. Uh, so I understood, um, you know, processes in healthcare. I understood what it meant to communicate to a patient, what it, I understood what, uh, listening skills were all about. Um, and I said to myself, how can I put all that together? and do something differently. And it, and at the time, healthcare consulting jumped right out as an option. And so I was able to take all of that passion and energy that I had being a physician into being a consultant. And that led to someone saying, wow, you're really good at this. How would you like to come to our hospital and be our chief medical officer? And I said, well, that sounds like a great idea. And so I transitioned into being a CMO for one hospital, which led to a larger organization, which kind of led to a larger. And so I started in 2000 with one hospital, and I ended up literally in 2018 with 18 hospitals in 12 states. Um, and then I retired from... Um, being an operations hospital operations person and went back into healthcare consulting. And I started that in January of 2019 and that's where I am today. Very cool. So let's, let's dive a little bit 
what's kind of what's a typical day or is it quite different because of the, the medical space is always a different day yeah so you know a typical day is um you know trying to find individuals who are in need who have uh strategy issues or who have issues with motivating their physicians as an example or who have issues with um um you know meeting the challenges of healthcare and so a typical day is working with a client on a project or an engagement that we've agreed upon or in seeking out someone that I could help uh and that passion and energy um working with individuals and that feeling of fulfillment after you've helped somebody is what just drives me every day. Uh, just motivates me to get up and, and want to go to work. And, and I say to your listeners, you know, if that's your passion, <clears throat> excuse me, if that's your passion, figure out what can I do that involves utilizing that passion. Again, my, my best friend is an actor Okay. And his passion is in acting and and displaying that energy and that character and that message that that character is delivering and and sending that positive energy and messaging out to viewers and listeners um uh, is what gives him the energy every day. And uh it's 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 fascinating because what we do is so different yet it's so similar interesting yeah i could i could very much see the the similarities that's that's actually quite interesting so I, i'm curious though so when you work with these clients what's kind of a typical process for you i'm sure it's a little bit different but do you generally kind of do do similar things or is it always quite different or how does that kind of work well i i think there's a similar approach which always starts with listening and again it's it's just fundamental to understanding what another person's challenges are but it's also fundamental to understanding um other people that you're in relationships with <laughs> is listening sure listening listening and also it's about how can I improve their situation? What suggestions can I give? What, you know, based on my expertise and experience, how can I help them be successful? But it's the same methodology for personal relationships. What can I do to improve my relationships with my wife, with my son, with my friends? Listen, 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 listen. Is there anything I can do to help? Is there anything I can do to make your day better? Is there anything I can do to reinforce in you to make you feel proud about you and what you're doing? Uh, and it's, it's just the same sort of approach to life that I've taken. And that's why I think I've been enjoying what I'm doing so much. Interesting. So you, you touched on something there that I, I think I want to dive a little bit deeper on. You, you talk about, um, people being proud. And I think p part of the problem that I've seen is some of the most successful people or who a lot of people would think are successful either aren't proud of their accomplishments, don't want to talk about their accomplishments, kind of think they're a fraud. What's your experience around some of that stuff and how do you get people to work through some of those issues? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's interesting. I, I had a discussion with a group of medical students <laughs> okay and um there's a thing uh it's called imposters syndrome mm -hmm. and so sometimes people are they they don't have confidence in themselves and they feel like somebody's going to find out that i'm really not what i'm saying i am right. i'm really not as good as i and so sometimes it involves making people aware of, look, what you're doing is incredible. You're the one that got you to where you are today. Sure. Um, so, 
also helping them find the pride in what they're doing can be key um, to helping others. I, 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 I think people are shy or they don't want to brag about what they do, but there's a difference between bragging and arrogance and having a level of pride in knowing that the, what you're providing to others, whether it's a service or, or whether it's a profession or whatever is truly based on things that you've been educated and shown how to do and do every day. So I try and get people to understand you need to be proud. You need to, and, and, and one other way I try and motivate people is I talk about having a mission. Okay. Uh, I was giving a, a presentation actually last Friday and I talked about that. And so when you're reluctant and you get lost and you're trying to figure out, you know, what am I doing? You always can fall back on your mission. Well, what's your mission in life? What do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? What's, what do you want to be your legacy? And when you're tied to those things, to your legacy, and when you're tied to your mission, it's easy to go back and feel proud about what you're doing. But if you don't know what that is, then you you could be kind of just walking through life almost robotically. I get up, I go to work, I come home, I just find there's something missing. Well, yeah, it's because you haven't you haven't found that mission, you haven't found that purpose, and that's what I think when you figure that out, that's when you begin enjoying every day and really living living life, you know. Yeah, no, Does I that make sense? agree. Yeah, totally. But but I'm curious though, how do people actually find that or or start to discover that? Because it, that's easier said than done, right? I think. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I'm, I'm I'm. Let me just give a disclaimer. I'm in sure. no way connected with the Covey, Stephen Covey, or his organization or anything. But I find that, as an example, they have a process whereby you first identify as an example, what are my values in life and how do those values create goals and how do those goals create, um, you know, tasks and milestones and how does that tie into some overarching mission in my life? And so, you know, it is a process, I guess is what I should say that should, if, if it's tied to, the core, uh, as an example, they say, what kind of parent do you want to be? What kind of spouse do you want to be? Right. What kind of employee do you want to be? What kind of citizen do you want to be? You, and you answer those questions and you create, okay, if I want to do that, then what kind of goals do I want to set? You know, and what kind of things do I want to do before I die? And, and then that creates a mission, if you will, and you can sort of check off the more things you do that are consistent with that mission and it gets you motivated. Um, I, I, again, I'll just give you a simple example. Sure. I, I've been trying to work out for just months and months. I can't get myself to go and I just not motivated. And I'm, I'm asking myself, what is it? I know the importance of exercise and I can't do it. Sure. But then I discovered Aikido, which is a, uh, really a defensive martial art that is more of a dance, more of a, a rhythm. And it actually, it's tied to a spirituality, a peace with uh, existence, with the earth, with other individuals. And I, when I discovered that, and I went and I went to a couple of classes, I found myself immediately there was no hesitation. I couldn't wait to the next, <laughs> you know, to the next uh, class, but it was because I connected with it. And now I'm getting the energy. I'm getting the exercise. Plus I'm also getting the message right. from my, from my sensei. And, and so it's, it's an example of connecting the action with a mission. Uh, and I think life is like that. And I, you know, I'm not an expert, <laughs> at how to find out what that is. But I think there is a process that if people have not found that they really need to seek out. Okay. And there's, you know, there's stuff on the internet and 
I've got a website. If people want to seek me out, I can help them on that journey also. Um, but I think connecting the mission helps you figure out and get motivated about life and get excited about life. No, fair. And, and it, at least in my experience with, with that, any of that stuff, is a lot of it's trial and error. Like you will try yeah. stuff and you will hate certain things. And it might take you 20 tries or 100 tries to find that one thing you enjoy. And it's, it's funny that you brought up the exercising thing because I've struggled with that as well. Like I just don't enjoy it in any way, shape, or form. Like I don't like right. going to a gym. Um, and the only way I find motivation to do it is if – we have like not like a crazy gym or anything downstairs, but I find just going downstairs when my wife goes to work out, that's like the only way right. it works for me, right? And so, right. I, right. but it took me, I don't know, number of times trying a bunch of different things from apps to DVDs to the internet to I actually know. going to the gym to, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. So I, I totally can relate to that. And it I guess when you finally find it, you're so relieved and happy, but... But man, the journey sucks sometimes. I know, and 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 you you named it. It's a journey, and you know you have to you have to be prepared for the journey. But that's <clears throat> that's why they call it life, you know. And I would say experiment with different things. I I tried Tai Chi, which is another right. beautiful way to get you motivated, and people just get addicted. Um, Pilates, whatever, you know. But just going to the gym and working out just for the sake of working out doesn't always ring everybody's bell. Sure. But, you know, clearly we understand that if you don't exercise, you're probably going to be debilitated if you live long enough. So it's important to get your body in shape so that you can, when you are 80, 90 years old, you're, you're mobile and you're not just, you know, because the body just breaks down. Yeah. So... It, it's just like you said, it's a journey and you'll try a thousand things until you finally find, hopefully till you find the right thing. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. So you talk about um, a bunch of ways to bring kind of grace, gratitude and joy into your life. Do you want to talk about some of those and why those are so important? You, you know, again, I just feel I could have died on at least, three occasions yeah wow well the, i guess you did and, and once right which is <laughs> right exactly well i i died on two of those and i, right, I guess okay i was resuscitated wow. and so i think that it's a conscious decision on my part to take that as a message that i need to help others understand how precious life is sure you know somebody else could have had a similar experience and come with a, a different conclusion but for me, it just means how can I help others? And so I've just gone on this mission to to um, to volunteer. I'm a volunteer for the American Heart Association. I'm a volunteer for several organizations because people are in need and they need direction and they need support and they need faith and and so. Um, we, I think we're often surprised at how much something so simple can make a difference in someone else's life. No, yeah. I, so, interesting. Yeah. Is there kind of common things that you see in people that you, you deal with kind of across all the different things you're involved in that you maybe want to demystify a little bit or, or try to get people to reconsider certain things because there's got to be a bunch of things that you see all the time that's pretty common that maybe there's not maybe not like a quick fix but there's maybe a, something that you could mention here that would get people at least thinking about or, or trying something new to maybe get out of whatever they're trying to get over you know i i think it's a great point so I don't know if it's my energy, <coughs> excuse me, or, or my openness, um, 
but I find that people generally are kind. People, it's, it's our common nature to be nice to each other. And today you would just, I mean, you would never realize that in some of the conversations that are going on in our country. Sure. But sure. I just find, I do a lot of traveling. I go to major cities. I've been to rural cities. I've been, I've been to areas where, you know, I'm African American. I've been to areas where I'm the only guy that I've seen who is a person of color all day long. And people have just been so incredibly nice that I really believe that, deep in people's hearts they want to be nice it's just we we're constantly being pit against each other right. and we're wow. constantly um a lot of our leadership today is tells us the solution is to blame somebody else i i just you know it's it's all in me you know what i can control and what i how i interpret i can't control other people's action but i can interpret their action so one is I believe that people generally are nice. And two, I believe that people arrive at where they are based on their life experiences. And I am in no position to make a value judgment. Uh, I may disagree with that, but sure. I try and come with an attitude of forgiveness and an attitude of just understanding that they had a different process to get to where they are today. And is there a common ground somewhere? And you don't hear a lot of that today. You hear people, you know, me, 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 me. Yeah. Uh, and right. so those are just some general principles that I think if we, if we put into place, it would be a different world today, certainly a different country. Um, so I try and live by those. And I, 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 I just believe Kevin, that when you throw that energy out there, that's what's given back to you. And so if you come with a frown on your face and if you come with a, like, you know, I deserve this and, you know, then people, people respond to that either, either directly or unconsciously. They, they're defensive or they're like, well, who is this dude? You know, but if you come with a smile on your face and you open the door for someone, people are always saying hello and thank you and yes, sir. And, you know, and maybe it's naive, but I just constantly see that reinforced with the energy that I put out in the universe. And uh, so I suggest people try it <laughs> if you haven't. <laughs> and I think if we had more a culture of understanding, um, we'd have some real serious breakthroughs. No, I, so that's I my two kids. <laughs> no, I, I a hundred percent agree with you. It, it is, it is quite fascinating how, how much we don't just try to understand where the other person is coming from. Right. It, that like, I don't, I don't know. You and I could pick a topic right now and we could uh, either if say, let's just say, I don't know. It, it doesn't matter what the topic is. Say, you, you, you and I disagree, but like, why wouldn't we want to have a conversation to at least understand where the other person is coming from on whatever issue it is, good, bad, or other, it doesn't really matter. And you don't have to get, convert the other person or they don't have to convert you. But if you at least understand what's happening, then you can at least hopefully, you know, figure something out and I think the world would be a lot better if we just did simple things like that. I know. And, and I believe I've also committed myself to a life of compassion. And if you're compassionate, even if I disagree with you, I may find a level of compassion in your experience and go, wow, you know, I, I just never saw it from that perspective. I get why you think that way. Totally. Or I get why you're feeling that way. And here's why I feel that way. You may go, wow, I never saw it from that perspective because I never took the time to listen. And I think that compassionate uh, way of living life allows for understanding and it allows for differences of opinion to coexist in a happy way, you know? 
No, totally, right? And I don't know. There's, I, I think the one big thing I always try to do with the show is, is obviously there's so much negativity around. It's like actually put out something positive, right? Or, or at least try to, or at least get people thinking about some of these things, right? And and maybe and hopefully motivate people to figure out how to find their passion and chase their dreams, right? Whatever they are, it doesn't really matter what they are. Just try to figure out how to go about doing it, right? And it, it sounds stupid, and I've said it a million times before on the show. It's like anybody that's ever achieved anything that they've ever wanted to do just decided to start one day. They just went for it one day. Whatever that right. means, they started small probably or they sent one email or they made a few phone calls or maybe they went to a networking event or i don't know the list goes on and on right but that mm -hmm. that's the one thing that i i hope people at least get at some point is just start doing whatever you want to do even if it's really really small something as simple as sending an email is starting at least in my opinion right. it sounds like you, you would right. agree with that I, I agree 100 percent absolutely so absolutely we're, we're kind of coming to the end of the show so how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself the book and any other links you want to mention yeah so um, the book is available on uh, Amazon um, it's available in Barnes and Noble in their bookstore uh, um, it's also available on my website, clearlivinglife.com. You can also leave me messages or information if you want more information. The book talks about, um, the importance of relaxation and recommends that people incorporate meditation in their life. And so, um, there are lots of, you know, cool little pearls in the book. The one thing I would say is at the end of the book, it also has a workspace for you to actually answer questions and insert your own situations and possible solutions uh, that you would put in place. Like, who do you know who would support you if you came into a life-threatening situation? Um, it talks about what would you, how would you start a mission statement? things like that. So it, it is a workbook also. Very cool. Um, well, Herman, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day, man. Thank you, Kevin. Be blessed, buddy, and we'll talk to you later. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community. Sign up for our newsletter or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.